Thank you, thank you. So uh, I have good news and bad news. The good news is you'll be seeing a brand new talk never seen before, and uh, the bad news is the same. Okay. <laughs> um, maybe. Okay. <laughs> so are we talking about sequence problems? and some hardness for these problems. These will be some problems that are solvable in quadratic time, and we'll give some reason why we can't really improve on them um, based on strong ETH, and in particular, the orthogonal vectors conjecture. Okay, so let me first define some sort of uh, sequence walk problems. Oh let, oh, let me do this first. Okay, so first I'm going to tell you what the plan is. The plan is I'm going to define a bunch of these problems so you can see what we're studying. And um, the particular problems I'll mention are for shade distance, edit distance, dynamic time warping, and the longest common subsequence problem. And then I will also give you some um, view on how to get algorithms for these problems. And then we'll talk about conditional lower bounds, but I'll only focus on one example, and it itself is already pretty complicated. Well, not that complicated, but it, it requires more work than the reductions we've seen so far. And, and also, when you see the proof, you, you sort of have some idea of how the other proofs go. So it's, it's, uh, it's a good example of, of these reductions. Okay. So let me start with the sequence problems. And the first thing I'll do is I'm going to talk about Frechet and dynamic time warping. And they have one thing in common, and they are sequence walk problems. So you're given two sequences. okay? And the sequences, let's say, are sequences of some points, and there's some distance measure between points. Uh, and this distance measure may depend on the problem. And now. You want to have a you want to walk on these two sequences one at a time, and the walk looks like this. You start at p1 and q1 in the beginning. In a in some particular step, you are at pi and qi. Let's say p3 and qt, uh, q2. You're there, and now at this in the next step, you have to decide where to go. And there's only three options. You're always walking to the right. The first option is you only go right on sequence P, so like this, okay? The second option is you go right only on sequence Q, so you go there. And the third option is you walk on both of them. Okay, so these are the types of walks we're exploring. We're given two sequences of points, and we're exploring walks of this form. And among these walks, we're going to optimize some measure. Okay, so the measure we are optimizing depends on the problem, but in particular, it's some function of the distance between the, the points in each step of the walk. And uh, Frechet and dynamic time warping have different functions. All right, so hopefully this is clear. Now I can define the, the next two problems. So the Frechet distance, uh, is the dog walking distance. So if you're a dog lover, uh, maybe you want to take your dog for a walk. And uh, to be nice to other people, you want to have a leash. OK, so now the dog has some trajectory it wants to traverse. And you have a trajectory you want to traverse. Let's say you want to get coffee. All right. Uh, but you're sort of limited by the length of your leash. And uh, let's say leashes are expensive for some reason, and you want to <laughs> min minimize the length of the leash. So let's say, uh, and now you're doing this walk where at each step, both of you decide w whether to go along your trajectory. And among all these choices of walks, you want to minimize the maximum distance between you and your, your dog, which is the length of the leash. So you want to minimize the maximum overall possible choices of way, ways to traverse the trajectories. So this is uh, the Frechet distance. It has a kind of nasty looking definition, but what I said makes sense. So in the continuous world, what you're given is two curves, let's say on the plane. They take points uh, from the unit interval between 0 and 1 and, and to the plane, and now f is some set of monotone functions that say basically in each point in time between 0 and 1 where on each curve you are at. 
And now the distance between the two curves under the Frechet measure is the minimum overall traversals of the curves, which are these functions of the maximum distance at, at, at any point in time. So this is the continuous version. Now uh, we kind of live in a discrete world, so we discretize it. And the way it's typically discretized is now the curves don't go from 0, 1. They go from the points 1 to n. And this just ma basically means time 1, I'm here, time 2, I'm here anyway. So, uh, and now this converts the problem from curves into a problem on sequences. Now you have sequences of points in the plane, and the traversals are now these uh, functions, non-decreasing functions from the time interval into your, uh, into your points on the curve. Okay, and it becomes exactly this walk, sequence walk problem. You're trying to find a walk along P and Q that minimizes the maximum distance um, between uh, you know, the points where you're at at each step. Okay, so this is Frechet distance. It's very widely studied, uh, and it has a pretty simple algorithm, which I'll describe on the slide. So here, here's again the definition. You have these uh, sets of functions that describe the, the ways you can walk along the curves, and you want to minimize uh, overall possible choices of traversals of both the curves, the maximum distance. And you can solve this with dynamic programming. You define some table, AIJ, that says what is the actual Frechet distance for the, for the sub subsequence from 1 to i and the subsequence from 1 to j. And then uh, you sort of naturally define it as the maximum of the distance so at points i and j, and the minimum of uh, whether you, you actually walked along p only, walked along q only in the previous step, or you walked along both of them. Okay, so this is some very simple dynamic programming algorithm. It runs in n squared time because we have n points on all, both of the sequences. And as usual for this uh, boot camp, you can get some tiny improvements. So there's a log n roughly improvement, uh, kind of recent actually. And there's many, many algorithms for some special cases and variants, but basically n squared is where we're at again. Dynamic time warping is another sequence walk problem. What is it? Now you have two sequences of points of length n. Uh, and uh, it's basically you find a walk along the sequences x and y that minimizes the sum of the distances of each step. So instead of taking the maximum distance that it would with first share, now you're taking all the sums. And, uh, it's often just defined with this, which is this, the dynamic programming algorithm. Uh, and <laughs> it has a lot of applications in speech processing, for example. You want to, uh, someone says a word, you want to know how, what they're actually saying. So this, this problem is used uh, to figure this out. Again, the simple dynamic programming algorithm is that, and it's, very, very similar to the Frechet one, but you just replace the max with a plus. Good. All right, so, so these are the sequence walk problems. So I'll, I'll talk about two other problems that, are, that can also be viewed as, yeah. Uh, is there a faster algorithm for this dynamic time working? Um, I couldn't find even a polylogarithmic improvement, but I suspect there should be one. I haven't tried. It's a good question. So whether n squared is actually the currently best? Probably not. But I couldn't find I couldn't find any literature. Yeah. So if you allow to step back, will it change the problem significantly? If you're allowed to go back, uh, probably the reductions no longer work. But I haven't thought about that. It's a good question. distance, this is uh, also one variant that is studied, and uh, you can also show hardness. Oh, this. you can? Okay. Uh, and square time for computing ex exactly. Oh, good. Okay, is that in your paper? 
<laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Maybe you, you could probably just have the points be getting closer and closer together as time goes by, so it's never worthwhile to go backwards. Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably. You probably have a reduction like that. Okay, so the next two problems won't immediately look like sequence walk problems, but they're still, you can formulate them that way. So the first one is something um, a lot of us teach in our algorithms courses. It's uh, the longest common subsequence problem. So you're given n sequences of letters, and you want to, to find a sequence that's a subsequence of both of them, and it has maximum length. So let's take these two words, meaning and matching. I want um, M, A, I, N, G is a subsequence of this one and of this one, and it happens to be the one of maximum length, and this is the longest common subsequence of these two words. So this problem has a lot of applications. Um, it has applications to computational biology. It's used in spell checkers and also um, solving this problem is at the basis of this diff utility in Unix, and there's a lot of, a lot of applications. So, okay, again, because it's uh, essentially defined in a similar way to the previous two problems, you can, def you can have a dynamic programming algorithm. You again look at what the best solution is for sequences up to i and up to j, and uh, now, depending on whether SI and TJ are the same, you, you, get, you add a one, uh, one plus this, and otherwise you don't. So, okay, so this is, this, is the, this, and you, again, you can get some improvements, a little, in, small improvements over n squared, but we don't know how to do much better. Okay. So, so then we have a slight variant on this, which is the edit distance problem. Uh, which is um, even more studied. So here we're given, again, two sequences of symbols of length n. And now you want to define the distance between these sequences as the minimum number of symbol insertions, deletions, and substitutions. So here's an example. Um, if we take the same two words as before, meaning and matching, you can transform one to the other in the following way. We take meaning, then we insert A in front of E. Now it becomes this bizarre word. Then we transform the E into a T. After that, you make A into a C, and then N into a H. And this, this concludes the transformation. And the number of changes you make is four. So each one of the insertion, deletion, and substitution, they have a cost of one, and so you want to find the minimum way to get from one word to another in this way. Longest common subsequence is the same as added distance when you disallow symbol substitutions. So this is the only difference between the two problems. And, and insertions as well, right? Oh, you, you can, um, yeah, it depends on whether you allow it in one string or the other, anyway. Ah, uh, okay, sorry, sorry, because it, it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's fine, um, okay. Good. Again, we have a dynamic programming algorithm basically following the definition that runs in n squared time. You can again improve it by a log factor. And there's thousands of algorithms for special cases. Uh, I thank Piotr Indic for some of these slides. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and then there's this very, very intriguing approximation scheme, which gets a polylogarithmic approximation in near linear time, so n to the 1 plus epsilon time. It's not what we really want. We would love to have something that gives you uh, a fixed logarithm or maybe like a 1 plus epsilon approximation, but we don't have any way of ruling this out and we don't have techniques to do this. <coughs> anyway. So there's that said added distance. Okay, so yeah. Do you know uh, of any hardness of approximation for uh, for the problem? Not for added distance. 
Yeah, there are, there's no hardness of approximation for any distance that we know yet. We've been trying, but it just, as you see, the reductions are, uh, they produce uh, an instance of, of checking whether the distance is some quantity or, or at least the quantity plus one. And getting a gap seems difficult with the current techniques. So, okay. So I define a bunch of these problems. You notice some of them are very similar. Uh, and what do they have in common? They're all very widely used matrix, uh, metrics. They're used all over the place and very practically motivated. They have simple dynamic programming algorithms. Basically, you look at the definition and it just happens. Um, we have absolutely no idea if you can do much better than n squared. People have explored uh, th proving threesome hardness for these problems for years and have not succeeded. And so perhaps they're hard under the orthogonal vectors conjecture in strong ETH because this is a different problem. Maybe you can get reductions from it, even though from threesome it has proven to be challenging. Okay. And okay. so this concludes the introduction of this. And now uh, I will take some more questions, and then I'll move to giving you some proof. So for this time warping distance, since you can either have one walk, two, or both, and you sum every step, it seems that the sequences where both walk all the time somehow have an advantage. Um, that's a good question. Uh, well, it sort of depends on how you, what the dif distances are. Sometimes it makes sense if you have something that's very cheap compared to some others to stay there until something changes. So, Can't, you can't gain by just waiting. <laughs> well, you're right. Sum is different from max. So. Okay. Good. So uh, I will just give a very quick reminder of what the orthogonal vectors conjecture was for people who maybe didn't see my previous talks. Um, I'm going to Say so. You have a, uh, a set of vectors uh, that all have uh, coordinates in zero, one to the d. d. D is some something that you can think of as slightly super logarithmic, or may maybe it's logarithmic, but a little bit more. The number of vectors is n, and we're asking if there's two of them that are orthogonal. So whenever one is uh, one of them has a one in some coordinate, the other one has to have a zero. You can trivially solve it in n squared times d time, just by following the definition. And uh, recently, uh, Ryan, Amir, and Ho Cheng got this algorithm that improved on n squared whenever, but the, but the improvement depends on uh, how far away d is from log n. So the further away you get, the closer this goes to n squared. So. Okay. Uh, the conjecture is that this problem cannot be solved in n to the two minus epsilon time for any constant epsilon, and a dependence that that's a polynomial in the dimension. And as we saw in previous talks, this conjecture is implied by the strong exponential time hypothesis. So, uh, so. Uh, we will just uh, focus on the orthogonal vectors problem. We won't be talking about strong ETH at all. And now all the reductions, or the single reduction I'll show you, will be assuming I have a set of vectors, uh, n of them, and they have very small dimension d. I'm not going to fix d to be log n. It will be d. And then uh, I will, I'll create instances of the sequence problems from this. So here's a theorem. Or th uh, union of theorems that we know about these sequence problems. We know that unless the orthogonal vectors conjecture fails, there's no uh, truly subquadratic algorithm 
for any one of any distance dynamic time warping for shade distance and longest common subsequence. So um, the first of these results were the, was the for shade distance result by uh, Brinkman, and who's right there. And uh, the edit distance result was from by Arthur Buckers and Piotr Imtik. And then we, uh, Arthur's and Amir and I, we got this longest common subsequence result. And independently of us, uh, Brinkman and Kuhneman also got that. So this is how things progress here. So there was this paper that I had with Amir and Oren Wyman, and we were considering some slightly harder looking sequence problems and that's, and we showed that they're strong at TH hard, and I think that this sort of made us think a little bit more about these problems and we got somewhere. All right, so what was the approach? The approach is actually, it's not going to be, we're only going to create a single instance of the sequence problems. We're going to take orthogonal vectors and just reduce it to two sequences. We take the set of vectors, and out, out of all of these vectors, we cre create a single sequence x, and again, we create a single sequence y. The nice property of x and y is that their lengths are only n times polynomial in the dimension. So when d is polylogarithmic, this is uh, actually roughly n, you know, and same here. So now, uh, what we want is that after we do this, the distance between x and y, depending on the problem that we consider, will be small if, if, the orthogon if there are two orthogonal vectors and it's large otherwise. And then we also want the construction time to be fast, and we actually achieve this with the construction time of n times poly d. And, and finally, uh, the way we do, the way we create these sequences, involves a bunch of gadgets. And what we we end up doing is, for every zero or one in in the vectors, we have to create a gadget that transforms it into subsequences, into small sequences. And these these gadgets have to interact in a nice way. Out of the coordinate gadgets, we make vector gadgets, and now the vectors have to interact in the right way. So whenever, whenever they're orthogonal, they have to have very small distance. Whenever they're not orthogonal, they have to be far away. And finally, we take these vector gadgets and make a big sequence out of them. And we still have to preserve this property that whenever there is an orthogonal vector, the distance is actually small. And when there isn't one, it's big. So each of these steps takes some careful combinatorial arguments. and. You have to be careful because the way you, you can walk on these sequences can be very, very diverse. So you have to, it's a delicate argument, but you'll see in a bit. Okay, so after this overview, I'll, give, I'll start talking about the hardness for the longest common subsequence. So if you have any questions, please ask. It doesn't mean it. Yeah, just because it looks simpler doesn't mean that. Yeah. So actually, having substitutions make the, makes the problem different, and you have to have different reductions to show hardness. But they're still similar in spirit. So. OK. So just a disclaimer, I won't be proving much. I'll just sort of give you the ideas. And I'll show you the full construction. Uh, so Carl and Marvin, they got an independent proof, which is different from ours. So you can check it out, too. OK, so what, what's the idea? Well, I have a lot of slides that say idea, because it's OK. But uh, OK, so the first, the first thing we'll do, we we'll just assume that we already have some really, really nice vector gadgets. So what does this mean? We have some way from every, every um, vector in our set of vectors, there's a way to construct a small sequence. 
f and a small sequence g, and it has this nice property that when I take the uh, two different vectors s i and s j, and I look at the longest common subsequence of f of s i and g of s j, it will be exactly some quantity beta if they're not orthogonal, and it will be something bigger than beta otherwise. It will be at least beta plus one. So suppose we somehow did this. It will require a bunch of work too, but suppose we had this. Uh, it will, maybe it will make our life simpler. Okay. Now I'll just say I'll add this vector s sub zero to to my set, which will be the vector of, of all ones. This vector is not orthogonal to anything, so it doesn't change my my problem very much. Okay, so now I'll try to attempt to, align, to put all of these little vector gadgets together in, in sequences. And it won't work. And then we'll try to fix it. It won't work again. We'll fix it again. And, and then in the end, it will work. Okay, so here's the attempt. So for the first attempt is I take my, my gadgets uh, for the first sequence and I put them one next to the other, f of s1, f of s2, f of sn. I take the other ones, also put them next to each other, but I also add this extra stuff on the left and on the right, which is just the gadget for the all ones vector repeated n minus one times in both cases. Okay, so this is just the first idea. So why do I do this? Well, the idea is sort of this is what we want. The, the, what we want is, well, if uh, if there is no pair of orthogonal vectors, and if you think, just think of these gadgets as just being one, one symbol, which is not going to happen, but assume for a moment that they are. And if, if uh, there's no S sub i and S sub j such that, they're, um, such that they're orthogonal, then all of them are non-orthogonal, so I can just, so no matter how I align F of S i with G of S j, I will always get beta. So the most I can get is n times beta. This is some heuristic argument. Now, if, if on the other hand, there's some pair, f of s i, some s i and some s j that are orthogonal, then I can align f of s i with g of s j to get beta plus one. And I can align everything before it with the gadgets for the all ones vector and everything after it to the gadgets of the s one vector as well, of, of the all ones vector again. So this part here, the green stuff, will give me um, n minus one times beta, and I'll get beta plus one from the alignment of S i and S j. So this is the idea. Okay. So again, if if my solutions always happen to match uh, an f uh, a gadget of of the f type to a gadget of the g type, then this will happen. So then, if there are no orthogonal vectors, then we'll get n, n beta, and, and if there are, we'll get something bigger. Now, of course, there's a problem because the optimal longest sum common subsequence doesn't necessarily align this with this. It may just sort of align various symbols with different gadgets. So we need to dis disallow this. Okay. So uh, let's try attempt two. Again, we assume we have these nice vector gadgets. So whenever two vectors are orthogonal, you get something bigger than beta. When they're not, you get beta. Now, what we'll do now is we'll take Q to be zero repeated Q, little Q times. So zero is some letter that didn't appear anywhere else. We'll take R to be one to the Q. Again, one repeated Q times, one didn't appear anywhere else. And what we'll do is around every gadget, I'll put a Q and an R. So what does this achieve? Um, well, first we have to prove some lemma, which I'm not going to prove to you. And the lemma says that if at any point one of the zeros of a Q is aligned with a zero here, then we might as well have aligned the whole block of, of zeros to the whole block of the zeros below. So we have to prove this. It requires some thought, but we can do this. And then the same happens if uh, 
one of the ones of an R is a match to one of the ones here, might as well have matched the whole block. Okay. So, is it, sorry, is it you're saying like if you match one bit of one Q in X with another bit of another Q in Y, then you might as well match the entire Q? Is that exactly. Right? That is exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying if if one of the one of the letters in one of the Qs here is matched to one of the letters of this Q here, then I might as well have matched all of the letters of the two Qs. So, okay. So now we can assume this. It depends on what Q is. We will set this little Q to be big enough in order for this to happen, but assume that this is the case. Yeah, little Q will be big. So, again, we, we pick Q big, okay? And now what happens is not, not only this, is this lemma true, but also all the Qs and Rs of X must be matched to a Y. And this is because if some Q is not matched to something in Y, then we pick this little Q so big that we lost Q alignments here. But we, and we cannot make them up by even if all of the Fs and Gs uh, were matched to each other. Uh, so this is the idea. So we pick this little q to be so big in terms of what's the maximum alignment between an f and a g. And, and now we enforce that all of the q's and r's of x are matched to something in y. All right, so now what we get immediately, we get that there is no g sub k that's aligned with more than one of the f's. Because if it's aligned with more than one of the f's, then we'll miss one of the r's and q's in the middle. So, so in one direction, we're fine, right? So this means that each of the Gs sub, uh, of S are mapped to a single F. But, there now, but now there could be multiple Gs that are aligned with the single F, so we haven't fixed that problem. So the, the solution might align F of S sub I with, with several G sub S of K. So, Okay, so now we're, we have a problem again, and we try to fix it. Okay. Um, but you just said that the Q's, the capital Q's and R's. Of X are all matched. So all the capital Q's and R's of X are matched to some Q's and R's in Y, but it could be that this one is matched to this Q, but R is mapped to a far away R. There are more Q's and R's in Y, so Yeah, Y has more Q's and R's because I added these in. Minus ones over here. And just to make sure, f and g never map to zero or one. They map to five and seventeen and something like that. Well, yeah, zeros and ones are letters that do not appear anywhere else. They only appear in Q and R. Yeah. Good point. So now, okay. So now what we have actually achieved is uh, that all the g sub g's over here, they're partitioned into these blocks where they're matched, where they're aligned with at most a single f. Okay, so we have these blocks, and this helps us actually. Here's the final attempt, and I think this one works. So now what we do, we pick a P. P is uh, some, P is this, which is a letter two doesn't, that doesn't appear anywhere else, repeated R times, and R is big, but it's smaller than Q. Okay, so now what I do is I put uh, P repeated the length of Y times over here, and P repeated the length of Y times on the left as well. This only at most you know, triples, triples the length of X, so. Okay, good. Uh, and on top of that, after each R, I put a P, and a P at the very beginning. Okay, so wh why would I wanna do this? So what I achieve is, Putting these p's, uh, because this, the length of p is actually smaller than the length of q and r, suitably chosen how small it is, we still get the property that every q and r of x is matched to some q and r of y. But after we have done that, because the length of p is still big, uh, we want as many of the p's to be matched to the, uh, as many of the p's of y to be matched to x. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, uh, look, at, look at how the Q's and R's were matched 
over here, uh, Q's and R's of X were matched down here. What happened is that the P's that are between these green lines cannot be matched anywhere in X because the only P's in X are on the outside. So when we, when we do this alignment and every Q and R of X is matched, we lose N minus one of the P's. Okay. But if we happen to align, the, whenever I align a Q, the R is matched right, right here. And whenever I align a Q, it's R is matched right after, it, after the G. Uh, then we'll only lose N minus one of the P's, which is exactly you know, the minimum we can lose. And, and because we made P very big, this will, this will actually happen in the longest common subsequent solution. Okay, so exactly n minus one of the p's in y are matched, and n also every f, sub, f of s sub i will be fully aligned with some g of s sub j. Possibly the all one string because maybe you aligned it here. All right. Okay. Questions. You need to be slightly careful because this. Q and R cannot be too big because it can be only polynomial in D. You cannot depend on N. Yes. Because the dump assumption is like to take another N, like Q equals to N. And, and then will work except we'll blow up your strengths. Yes. But, so, but then the argument with this lemma is a bit more careful. Yes. That's why I said that you don't get a full proof. Uh, you have to be careful. Yes, all of these P's, Q's, and R's have to be polynomial in D, and they are. And you have to show that things still work when they're short. So the lemma requires more work. Yes. So essentially, if you if you have a mapping of one to many of the let's say from the top to the bottom, then you are skipping an entire P. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you don't have uh, what enough of them. Uh, you don't get enough of the uh, from the F and G alignments. You don't get enough to make up for this entire P that you get you got. Okay, so what you can gain uh, extra, let's say, by making, uh, by mapping pieces of the y string to different mm -hmm. pieces to, to x, uh, is not enough uh, to justify the, the loss of one single p, right? Exactly, exactly. It's not enough to uh, make up for the loss of a single p, and you have to show that this still happens when p is polylogarithmic in d. Uh, but you can, uh, not polylogarithmic, polynomial in d. Okay, polylogarithmic in n. So, yes. So now what we've achieved is that we actually have an alignment of the, F sub I, of the SIs and SJs, exactly. Uh, and because I, I only put n minus ones here, n minus one of the all ones vectors here, and n minus one of the all ones vectors here, there will be some S sub I that is mapped to one of the S sub Js. So, Let's talk about the length of the longest common subsequence. You will get 2n times p from aligning the p's because you lose n minus 1 p's, but we al you align all of the p's in y. And how many p's in y are, are left? Uh, we, we, let's say n minus 1 are lost, and then you count the rest. This is n, and then this is n plus 1, and this is n minus 1, so you get 2n. So 2NP comes from aligning all of the P's from Y. N times Q plus R um, is the cost from aligning all the Q and R's of X. And you can check that there's N of them. And then uh, the rest comes from aligning uh, S size with SJs, possibly some of the SJs are as zeros. And then uh, what you get is that if there is no orthogonal pair, the entire contribution of the red part is n times beta, because there's only n of the f, f sub s of i's, and each one is aligned with exactly one g of s sub j. And if there is an orthogonal pair, you get an extra plus one, because in the position where you put an s i and s j and you align them, you, you get uh, beta plus one instead of beta. Okay. So, this would be the reduction if we actually had the vector gadgets.
How big is beta compared to these other scores? Uh, so beta, um, you'll see in a moment. I'll, I'll give you beta. Okay. Any more questions? So now we know what to do the moment someone gives us vector gadgets. And now we have to construct the vector gadgets. Um, so before that, I, I think I already said, all of these quantities will be polynomial in D, so we're fine with the length of the strings. They're n times poly D. And now we'll construct these. Okay, the vector gadgets. Um, similar to uh, what we did before, we'll now assume we have coordinate gadgets, and we'll construct these in the end. So what's a coordinate gadget? It, there are two functions that take the, a bit, 0, 1, and create a sequences. And the sequences, there are sequences C and E, and the sequences have this property that the longest common subsequence of C of X and E of Y is 0 if both, X, the, both, both the bits are 1 and it's uh, 1 otherwise. So if Bless you. If you get 1 and 1, you get a 0 contribution to the longest common subsequence, and you get a 1 if there's 1, 0, 0, 1, or 0, 0. This is very nice because uh, when you take uh, inner products, this is exactly uh, what you care about. When you, when you get a 1 and, and a 1, 1 and 1, sequ 1 and 1 vector and 1 in the other, you get that they're not orthogonal, and this is when you want the longest common subsequence to be to be small. So. OK, so let's assume that somehow we get these coordinate gadgets and that they're very, very short. So they're sequences of length 2. Uh, we'll see this in a bit. So now, assuming that we have them, we're going to create the vector gadgets in a kind of a similar way to what we did before. We're going to pick a letter 5, which doesn't appear anywhere else and a letter 3 that doesn't appear anywhere else. We'll pick the number of repetitions of 3 to be this exact quantity, where u is the number of phi's in each block. So we'll, you'll see why I picked this in a second. You don't have to care about it right now. But the idea, what's the idea? So there's two ways to align these things. Either you align sum 3 to sum 3, in which case you cannot align any of the, the other stuff with each other. If you align a 3 with a 3, you have to align the entire 3 block to the entire 3 block, and you only get a contribution of r to the long x comma subsequence. Uh, OK. Oh, I should do. And then, um, also again, we, we can show this lemma because of the choice of u's and r's, that if you ever match uh, two 5's, then their entire blocks uh, are matched together, the same lemma as before. And uh, what I just said is that if any three is matched from here to there, then no other symbols, uh, no other non-three symbols are matched, and all the threes are, and the, le and the length is r. Now what happens if the threes are not matched? Then we match this, this other portion with this other portion here. And then uh, we set this up so that all the fives must be matched. If you lose a single five, then you lose an entire block of u fives. And if you lose an entire block of u fives, the length of the longest common subsequence will be too small. It will be uh, d times u, because so originally we had d plus one uh, u, uh, blocks of five. If we lose one of them, we only have uh, d of them, and then we get d times u of them the contribution of the rest of the subsequence is at most 2 times d, because uh, the, the, these little subsequent, these coordinate gadgets was of length 2. And so uh, even if we mash all of them, we only get 2d. And so in the end, we get something that's less than r uh, by our choice there. So we mu if no 3 is mashed, all of the 5s have to be. And if we mash every single one of the 5s, then they have to be mashed like this. And this means that the alignment is of these C's and these C's like exactly as in the vector vector world. And, we'll, and if we have the coordinate gadgets, then immediately we get, uh, what do we get? 
we get that the, either the longest common subsequence is R whenever uh, the vectors are not orthogonal or it's more than R otherwise. And it's more than R because you get, uh, you get this plus one. The what? You'll see it on the next slide. Oh. <laughs> Good question. See, you're paying attention. <laughs> yeah, the, the letters are from 0 to 6, so we're missing 4 and 6 right now. So we'll see 4 and 6 on the next slide. I know. Okay, finally we get we have to do coordinate gadgets. Uh, oh, what, what am I doing here? Oh, yeah, I had to tell you that if all fives are matched, then for every t we have a matching between c of si of t and c of si of sj of t. That should be a j. And, oops, and that's an e. So e and j. That's what we have to uh, go that way. And so this is an e here, too. Okay, sorry about that. And so you, what you get, again, is what I said, is that uh, you get d plus 1 times u plus d minus 1 of r, and we get less than that if they're not orthogonal, but if they are, you're going to get extra 1. Okay. I said this before. Okay. So if, if they are orthogonal, you get that all the fives are matched, and they're d plus 1 times u of them, and you get d from every single one of these matches because they're all a 0, 1, 1, 0, or 0, 0. Okay, so this immediately gives us the longest common subsequences are if they're not orthogonal, and it's r, at least r plus 1 otherwise. Okay, coordinate gadgets. Uh, what do we want? We want these gadgets C and E such that whenever the two bits are one, uh, you get the, the longest common sequence is zero of length zero, and otherwise you get a one. So there they are. Okay? So C of zero is four, six. C of one is four. E of zero is six, four. E of one is six. You notice that E of one and C of one have a longest common subsequence of zero, and all the others uh, have a one of one. And they're, they're very short. So, so this is it. Then I'll give you a little bit of a conclusion and we'll finish. OK. So the recap of the reduction, we use coordinate gadgets to make vector gadgets. We use extra symbols to enforce cooperation. Uh, and then we use vector gadgets to make these sequences, again, using extra symbols. Uh, to make them cooperate. And this happens in all the reductions. Okay, so here's some extensions that using the same type of reductions you can do. First of all, we don't need to start from orthogonal vectors. We can start from something that counts the number of coordinates in which, uh, how far you are from being orthogonal in a sense. And this also means you can make this thing work under this slightly maybe slightly more believable com hypothesis that you can't solve max k sat for all k faster than 2 to the n time. So there is, for every epsilon, there is x a k such that this uh, happens. So maybe it's more believable. Uh, you can also prove this theorem. Instead of taking two sequences, you take k of them. And now you want to know the longest common subsequence of all of them. You can show that. Uh, KLCS cannot be solved in this much time, uh, and, and to the K minus epsilon time under the orthogonal vectors conjecture. And also, this is the alphabet size is order K, which is actually small. There's no uh, dependence on N. That's nice. Uh, and uh, Bringman and Kinnaman showed that you, uh, our alphabet size was seven. They showed you can bring it down to two. We, we thought we could do it too, but it required more work, so we didn't work on it that hard. Okay. So in conclusion, um, so all the reductions 
for fresh air at a distance, dynamic time or warping, they use similar ideas, they have a similar flavor, you, do some, you have some gadgets, you combine them in a clever way, and uh, I think you can probably do it for other sequence problems. Uh, so is there any hardness for approximating these problems? Uh, we don't know how to do this. Uh, so Carl did it for, um, for shade distance, but for longest common subsequence and edit distance, we don't know how to do it because the reductions are only about uh, distinguishing between a quantity and a quantity plus one. And then, is there any sort of hardness about getting some super logarithmic speed up? Maybe not. Maybe we can get more than fully logarithmic soon. I don't know. Um, so th those are my main two questions about sequences. And uh, this concludes my talk, so thanks. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's any hope of showing equivalence between them, or? Of reductions between them? Ah, it's a great question. Is there some equivalence between them? Maybe. I I haven't worked very hard on it, but it sounds like a good problem. Yeah. Or I'm vaguely remembering there is some kind of firm approximation hardness without four LCS. Oh yeah. Uh so we, sh so our result implies some um, W one hardness when the when the alphabet size is order k. So that wasn't quite it wasn't known. It was known that it's it's very hard when you allow the alphabet to be really big. So what's the best approximation for NCS when you allow linear time? Is it known anything? Not sure. Probably not much is known. And the second question may be silly, but what is known if you want to walk K dogs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Do you, do you know, Carl? I don't think so. Well, you should walk probably in n power K time, right? Yeah, it's upper bound twice, test consensus. But for low bound, well, nobody cares about K-dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why do you need K-dogs? It probably depends on how you hook the dogs up. Take the simple, <laughs> the simple way, right? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's the point. Is it, is it the star, or are they on a line, or...? <laughs> You can walk actually a dog in the graph, probably, right? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> a random dog walk. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Good question. You might want, sorry, you might want a minimum of all the leashes. Sorry? Well, K-dogs, you might want a minimum of all leashes, like if you have a bunch, oh. you, you have a... So at min max min, oh, or min max, yeah, okay, min min max, sounds good. But then you could just do the pairwise pressure just to... And solve it, I see. So maybe the sum? Yeah, you sum of the Sum of the max. And then still you could just do the pairwise, if it's a star, then you just do the sum of the pairwise distances, or maximum of the pair of the distances, be some function of the distances. No, oh, no, sorry. Okay. Because you have to go on the same walk. The other dogs walk differently. Yeah, yeah. I think open problem. I'll put it on the slide. K dogs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Any more? Yeah, for Brit. This reduction, no, this uh, reduction that you presented is very tight, right? In the sense that uh, suppose that you improve uh, uh, the. On an orthogonal vector, you go, you get n to 1.99. Then you will get exactly, roughly the same up to polylog factors, right? Roughly. If you improve, sorry. So you get a faster algorithm for orthogonal vector. You you don't lose much here in the reduction. You essentially get the same. Here. Yeah, because you do you have a single instance, so uh, and you only get a, a something de that depends on d as the overhead. So so the run times will be roughly the same up to poly d factors. So you you change the the constant, right? But uh, <coughs> 
these orthogonal vector reductions, you you get this type of very tight. Uh, I mean, this is uh, your experience. Uh, sometimes you get very tight, and usually it's because you only did one, <laughs> one to you know one string, one instance to one instance. But uh, actually, it's a good point. I think maybe maybe for the approximation portion, if you wanted to show approximation hardness, maybe you need to do more instances. Maybe it would be nice. At least this type of reduction doesn't seem to do it. But. Thank you.